Welcome to Close Listening. I'm Zach Morgenstern, joined as always by silent co-host Ludwig von B. And today we are going to talk about a record called Destroyer by Kiss. I've, I've wanted for a long time to get into Kiss, and these last several months I've really been focusing on that, uh, listening to a few of their records. You know, you see this band, uh, at least to me as a, like a young kid, seeing their faces for the first time, I'd have thought, wow, this is so cool. But also I'm not someone who likes particularly hard rock music, so there's this tension in me. You know, I don't like music that's like super hard rock, but I also like the aesthetic of bad boy, Halloween-y, super hard rock, and so I wanted to find Kiss that was right for me. And I have to say, if anyone else is in that position, I would absolutely recommend Destroyer. And that it feels extra special because previously, when I've listened to and enjoyed Kiss records, uh, such as the such as the Dynasty album or such as Paul Stanley's solo album, I've seen that they're less liked uh, by hardcore Kiss fans. They kind of view those records as them going too soft. And I think what's what's fascinating about Destroyer is it manages to be this perfect compromise between the sort of more kitschy Kiss fans like myself and the more hard rock purist Kiss fans because it is an album that really emphasizes electric guitar. It has some very heavy singing, particularly on the opening track, uh, but it's also a very clean, bright production. You can generally hear the lyrics pretty well, so it, it caters to both audiences. And for that reason, I think it's often talked about as one of the, if not the greatest Kiss album. So let's talk about the songs on here. One of Kiss's most iconic songs is the opening track for this record, and it's called Detroit Rock City. Uh, I don't think Kiss actually has any particular connection to Detroit. I believe the guys are all originally New Yorkers, and I was actually inspired by an event that took place in Charlotte. So I really think this song just gets its title from Detroit sounding cool in context. So what I'd say of this song, to borrow the name of my show, this is a song that really merits a close listen. So I actually first heard Detroit Rock City a few years ago when I took a Kiss Greatest Hits album out of the library. The album was called Kiss World. And the problem with that one is the context in which it put the song in wasn't really great. You see, Detroit Rock City opens with this really long introductory sequence, which is just bits of uh, staticky radio broadcasts stitched together. And in the context of a Greatest Hits album where you're already hearing bangers like Crazy Nights and Rock and Roll All Night and I Was Made For Loving You, and suddenly you have this long, awkward pause with radio static and then vocals that are a bit blurrier than on those cleaner, poppier hits, it's a bit hard to get into. However, as an opening song, Detroit Rock City is truly epic. In this context, because the radio broadcasts come at the very beginning of the record, they don't take you out of the flow. They're this nice, intriguing little buildup. So this is a song about the oddity of death. You know, the fact that most people wake up every day and they wake up the next day and life goes on, it's mundane. Yet, Occasionally, someone will do something stupid, and it all ends, and it's the full drama and tragedy of death, and that's just that. Uh, again, I believe Paul Stanley was inspired by uh, reading a story about uh, a KISS fan uh, dying in a car crash in Charlotte, North Carolina. And when you listen closely to the radio broadcasts at the beginning of the song, they kind of zoom in and out of focus. Like, they tell you about the crash, but then they quickly lose interest in it. And this captures the fact that a person's death can both be so dramatic and striking, and yet it also happens every day. It's it's part of it's part of everyday life. And it's a really well edited introductory sequence. They sample Kiss's rock and roll all night. It's as if to say Kiss and maybe the rebellious image of the rock and roll lifestyle might have caused a certain reckless person to die. And if you listen very closely, you hear this person kind of mumble singing along along to the song. It's it's quite haunting if you think about it. So that's just the radio signal at the beginning, but Detroit Rock City is itself quite an epic song. I know I said the vocals are a bit blurry compared to something like Rock and Roll All Night or Crazy Nights, but in context they're not so bad to listen to and they're certainly very powerful. Paul Stanley is a very muscular voice when he wants to and also a very emotional voice. 
The guitar solo is clearly well thought out. It's its own distinct melody and adds a brightness to what up to that point is a very thumpy wheels rolling on the road kind of a song. But it's it's still, despite being a hit, being catchy, I would still call Detroit Rock City a bit of a, an acquired taste because it's almost intentionally about building up to something. You know, it's this excited, rebellious young person driving to a concert and never making it. And there's something about the the chorus that never quite reaches that climax. You know, it's intense, it's cool, it never quite gets where it's going. So that song I know inspired a lot of talking. With everything else, I think I can be more con concise. Track two, King of the Nighttime World, flows directly out of Detroit, Rock City, and it's the same idea, young people with rebellious after work, after school imaginations, but no one dies in this one. Then you get another classic, track three, God of Thunder. Uh, and this one was written by Paul Stanley, which surprised me because Gene Simmons sings it, and frankly, it feels like the theme song for his demon persona. So one of the oddities with Kiss is that uh, their, their four original makeup wearing members all had these characters. You know, Gene Simmons was the demon, Paul Stanley was the star child, Ace Fraley was the spaceman, uh, and Peter Chris was the cat man. But the nature of their music isn't such that they don't really get to develop these personalities. So it felt like another cool thing they got to do with Destroyer is write this theme song for Gene Simmons, which is, you know, kind of literally about a diabolical figure, but also just kind of about the worship of rock stars. Track number four, Great Expectations, was a real shocker. I mean, this is a very poppy song, so it kind of surprises me that mainstream KISS fans who don't like albums like Dynasty uh, do seem to really like Destroyer, because on this song, where Gene Simmons is also the lead vocalist, he almost sounds like Freddie Mercury, uh, and it's a very affected song. It sounds like something produced by Phil Spector uh, with some of the additional instruments coming in on the chorus. And it's it's thematically on point. It's about people in a concert and being awestruck by those on stage. Uh, but certainly the Charles Dickens inspired title adds a little pomp to it. Uh, we get more songs about rebellious young people. Track number five, Flaming Youth, is exactly that. And then you get Gene Simmons uh, singing about BDSM in track six, Sweet Pain. Track seven is another classic, Shout It Out Loud, uh, thanks to the memorable guitar riff and the fact that you have Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley sharing the vocals. I always like it when you hear both of them singing. It adds a melodic dimension that shows why Kiss had a reputation of being the Beatles of hard rock. Uh, and, you know, it's not that deep a song. It's not the kind of thing that commands too much commentary, but it could be a source of wisdom in the context of this album. It could be its message is saying, you know, don't worship the rock stars. Shout it out loud yourself. You know, listen to what's inside your own head. Track eight, uh, quite dramatic. It's Beth. This, I think, is Kiss's only ever number one charting song, which is ironic since Peter Chris, the drummer, is the only member of Kiss who performs on it. And I don't think he's actually drumming. He's just singing the lead vocals, and you have the New York Philharmonic Orchestra in, in the background. I, I guess every rock band has to have their one overly sentimental soft song. But it's still wonderfully strange that Peter Chris, the first member of Kiss to lead Kiss, is the only one here, uh, and yet long after he left, they continued to have it, having to play it in their tours. I believe in the most recent tours, uh, they made their then drummer, Eric Singer, do the singing because I guess someone had to do it. Uh, and Beth is an over-the-top song about a band member who get can't get in home on time from a rehearsal and has to apologize to his wife. So I guess broadly part of the concept of this record, you know, showing rock stars are not gods, they're humans and they have quite mundane problems. Uh, and then you get track nine, Do You Love Me? Just a bit of a different sound with its thumping drums in the background. And again, you could analyze this one about being, you know, people love the wealth and excess of rock stars, but do they love them as people? But again, not really a song that commands deep analysis. Uh, and then you have a little bit of an instrumental outlook and it just sort of mixes different song sounds from the record, including from the song great expectations. So a very interesting record we have here.
Bob Ezrin, a very important music producer, played a big role in forcing Kiss to, Kiss to really polish out their songs, you know, not just jump into the studio, play some hard rock and have a track. Clearly very produced work, yet still falling within the tradition of guitar-centered rock and roll. This album truly is the album for a broad cross-section of the music listening to world to enjoy. It's concise, but it's epic. The, the lyrics are simple, but they're filled with emotion. Uh, and as you can see, you have these comic book illustrations of Kiss on the front, and as if to say, okay, in our previous three rec records, we were this semi-successful jam band, but now we're bursting out at you, we're aspiring to be rock stars. You wanted the best, you got the best, you got Destroyer. So let me know your thoughts on Destroyer in the comments below. I'm Zach Morgenstern. This is Ludwig von B. See you next time. Thank you.